What's good, Josh? Will Ross back at again with another video. So we're gonna check out 10 iconic wrestling gimmicks you didn't know were stolen. Now, this should be a very interesting one. I think we've talked about this where wrestlers are get get inspired from wrestlers of the past or whatnot. It's it's a part of the wrestling business. Like some people feel like, oh, it's copying or stealing someone's idea. Mm, not really. If you make it your own, we all we are all influenced by someone or you know a certain thing that's been done in the past. Not even just in wrestling, and just in all aspects of life. That's just what it is. So it's gonna be very interesting to see um, what you know how they're relating to stolen gimmicks per se. Should be an interesting one. Appreciate all the love and support you guys shown on the channel. We're gonna get right into this. Pro one, wrestling has an incredibly relaxed attitude mm. towards plagiarism, or rather, inspiration. Ric yeah. Flair took the Nature Boy nickname from Buddy Rogers, God uh -huh. rest his soul. Triple H, in turn, took on the Flair role in 2003, except that his promos, not his matches, often lasted for an hour. There yeah. are, however, less famous but far more insane gimmick thefts to wade through. So, with that in mind, I am Gareth here from What Culture Wrestling, and here are 10 <laughs> iconic <laughs> wrestling gimmicks you didn't know were stolen. Number 10, Road Dog. Not only is Road Dog a difficult wrestling act to plagiarize, there's no real money in it really. It was fun to <laughs> chant along with his shtick in 1998 in the mm -hmm. building, but nobody honestly paid to enter those buildings to watch the guy. They were there to watch Stone Cold Steve Austin. Yeah. So which Jelly for Brains moron would think parodying the Road Dog was a good idea? Well, Vince Russo of course. As part of his powers that be character, he told Brad Armstrong, one of the most underrated sellers and mechanics ever that he needed a TV friendly gimmick. Armstrong was made to arrive at Buzzkill. In a meta upon meta development, he parodied his own brother in a parody of a televised wrestling show. It was just a bit odd. Buzzkill came out to a sound alike of Road Dog's theme with cornrows and even had a similar B-U-double-Z call and response. How strange. Oh Number 9, Kane. God. If you want to- oh, Jesus, now nah, I see why WCW <laughs> ended up getting bought out by Vince. It's just cheese, bro. What is that? That's that's appalling. Rip off Kane in 2023, the process would be simple and quick, if very painful. If you repeatedly bang your head against a brick wall, you turn out just as stupid as he is. Failing that, you wear his attire, except a blue away kit version. And be uh. Kane, except blue. Now there's a certain incredibly temporary charm to this bit that recently did the rounds on the mm -hmm. irony indie circuit. Blue Kane plays Kane, but a blue... Yeah, I've, I've, I've seen this. I've seen it so many times. It's, it's literally a motherfucker just with a blue fit on. He's Blue Kane. What is this? Pokemon Red versus Blue? Like, what are we doing? What is this? That's literally what it is. If you guys or old enough, showing my age, you guys remember the Game Boy Pokemon games. There was Pokemon, I believe Pokemon Yellow. That's the one I had. Um, then there was Pokemon Red. And then there was Pokemon Blue. That's literally what it is. It's And they were all mostly the same games, different stuff. But one had just color in it. One had a red tint on the gameplay. One had a blue tint on the gameplay. That's it. That's literally what we got here version who has snow powers instead of fire powers. Wow. The idea being that he does cane things without being a rancid individual. Said account would inevitably be suspended on the social media hub known wow. as X of course, with Blue Kane now going by the name of Blue K. And carefully trying to live in Elon's weird world what? without mentioning that awful Jacobs. Number 8 Steve Austin. Oh Steve Austin has of course spawned more than one famous imitator. Shark Boy was less plagiarist and more loving irreverent parody and the same applies to the wonderfully stupid and weirdly uncanny Stone Cold E.T. Austin also Stone Cold E.T. bro what are we this is this is bad <laughs> Stone Cold E.T. Also heavily, heavily influenced Horace Hogan, who is funnier than a comedy meme wrestler due to the sheer <laughs> insolence factor. Horace was a dull and basic grunt of a brawler. He only got a WCW gig because he was Hulk Hogan's nephew, and yet he didn't have the courtesy to draw inspiration from his uncle. There was a bigger star in wrestling from whom to copy in a boneheaded bid to make it big, and that man was Austin. Thanks for the job, Uncle Terry, but you are past it, old man. Everything about Horace 
316 is wonderful. The bald head, the jean shorts, the goatee, even the knee brace is pure Austin. And in the best touch of all, his waistcoat was white. The idea that wearing a black one would have made things too obvious is incredible. Number 7, The Rock. While Just Kevin Nash believes that geez. LA Knight is a blatant rock ripoff, it's not quite fair really. There are obvious similarities between sure. the two performers, but LA Knight sets himself apart by going a bit more nuts, losing his composure and being electrified by himself. That element <laughs> of his character was borrowed from Ric Flair, yes. Yeah. But Rock himself borrowed from Flair with his rhyme yeah. heavy promo style and catchphrases. For an actual blatant rock ripoff, see The Rock JR, who sought to go viral on the Canadian indie circuit in the mid 2010s. This is not subtle. The Rock is in the guy's name. The Rock JR. The Rock Jun. This is. This is taking inspiration a little bit too far, man. But it is very, very stupid. He does everything The Rock does. Flips his tongue out, lowers his sunglasses, says the exact same things. Except he does them poorly. This doesn't even seem to be a bit. The guy just does The Rock's act, but not very well. Now I've got a question. What is your favorite wrestling catchphrase? The Rock JR clearly loved him some homemade cooking. <laughs> now let me know what you loved in the comment section below. Jesus. Number six, the APA. Wrestling is absolutely stupid. It's <laughs> <laughs> stupid now, but in the 1990s, it was very, very stupid. WCW found itself in the crosshairs of Vince McMahon's lawyer, Jerry McDevitt, more than once throughout that decade. Vince wasn't remotely happy when it was implied that Scott Hall still worked for him in May 1996. The former earthquake John Tenter worked for WCW as Avalanche before Vince decided they were taking the piss and threatened legal action. A similar scenario unfolded with the big boss man. His WCW name, The Boss, was also too close to the WWE US intellectual property. And it didn't help that Tony Schiavone would say, the boss, man is he big. WCW wow. did get a bit smarter when borrowing a tune from the WWF though. Mm. By the time Asia ripped off China, now there is a statement, the WWF yeah. was so big that they'd stop caring. <laughs> but w Asia ripped off China, that's... Okay, <laughs> I just caught that. WCW was slightly less on the nose when presenting the chronic unit of Brian Adams and Brian Clark to audiences in 2000. The WWF's APA were stiff, unrefined brawlers who drank beer. Chronic were stiff, unrefined brawlers who smoked weed. They weren't very good at protecting anybody mind. They weren't even very good at protecting themselves. Having worked one of the worst WWE matches ever against the Brothers of Destruction at Unforgiven 2001. And speaking of, number five, The Undertaker. The Undertaker, of course, Oh no, there's definitely been probably a few people that have tried to rip off that gimmick alone. It's one of the greatest wrestling characters of all time. ...influenced the creation of his storyline brother, Kane. But that was the point. Kane mirrored his mannerisms and arsenal, and indeed his slow walking gait. Very effective in late 1997, and again between 2001 and 2002, Kane wasn't able to replicate The Undertaker's electrifying late stage streak form. The Undertaker also influenced a meme wrestler that you may have heard of, and also influenced, to put it mildly, Tatumba El Enterador, which in English is Tatumba The Undertaker. A wrestler based in Argentina who sadly passed away on June oh, 22nd. Wow. Dave Meltzer of the Wrestling Observer Newsletter noted that when Taker broke big in the early 1990s, Tatumba basically just grifted his shtick wholesale. Very little is known about the man and the performer outside of his homeland, but as you can tell by these images you are seeing right now, he was no UK Undertaker. His look was really well done, fusing the Taker aesthetic mm. with something of a Middle Ages plague victim touch. Wait, 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 wait. The UK Undertaker, number four, every what? WWE star of the 1990s. In the early 1990s, through the rise of Sky TV, the WWF got hot in Britain several years after the promotion exploded in the US. So many years, in fact, that the Fed was already dying on the other side of the pond. This allowed Vince McMahon to promote SummerSlam in front of a legitimate attendance of 80,000 at Wembley Stadium. This also allowed a bunch of beans on toast carnies to run fake wow. WWF shows at leisure centers all Whoa. over the land. <laughs> look look at the the picture they have for stone cold that who the fuck is that that's not stone cold bro who is that that's not kane who are these people <laughs> what
after. Yes, if you were a fed mad 90s kid, there's a high chance you begged your parents to watch WWF wrestling at the same place you took swimming lessons and went to <laughs> five-a-side football parties. There, you'll have seen various nobodies from a dead British scene pretend to be superstars. For younger fans, imagine NXT UK with slightly worse production values. Number three, That's Razor funny. Ramon. Razor Ramon was a shameless, self-professed Tony Montana ripoff. Uh -huh. The speech pattern adopted by Scott Hall was unmistakable. He saw a cool movie and decided to play the guy in it. In a case of art imitating life after life plagiarized art wholesale, and with no <laughs> compunction, Razor Ramon influenced another character, Razor Ramon Hot Guy, which was not the character's original name. Well, sort of at least. Portrayed by comedian Masaki Sumitani, Razor Ramon HG bore no resemblance whatsoever to Hall's character, the incredulity of which made it funny. HG wore a PVC suit at literally every moment possible, even when being threatened, thrust his hips so quickly that he practically vibrated. He entered the ring to Ricky Martin's Living La Vida Loca, and wow. for a brief time in the 2000s was a well-regarded comedy wrestler for the insane uh... hustle promotion. The joke was very much ruined when it was revealed that Sumitani was actually straight, which lent a bleak note of mockery to the bit. Number two, Dave Meltzer. Pro wrestling has a strange and invariably <laughs> unproductive uh... history with parodying the wrestling media. In WCW, in front of nonplussed fans, Hulk Hogan burned a copy of the Wrestling Observer newsletter on pay-per-view in retaliation for Dave Meltzer correctly reporting that Randy Savage was carrying an arm injury and that he would nonetheless win the titular World War 1995 match. In NXT, Andre Chase at a worked press conference was asked a question by Dave. Chase asked if it was a five-star question and said he'd imagine <laughs> this particular Dave's smug face whenever he punched his opponent. Even in AEW, a critically revered show, QT Marshall is doing QTV, which is a paranoid and unfunny bit about how journos enjoy ruining wrestlers' careers. The irony is palpable. None mm. of these promotions got there first, though, because Herb Abrams' Universal Wrestling Federation went as far as to debut a rotund, hapless jobber who went by the quite brilliantly patronizing name of Little Davy Meltzer. Incredibly, wow. Abrams managed to get Bruno San Martino on board to commentate on his loss to Steve Williams, but Bruno refused to sell the bit. Meltzer has an incredible business mind, is a profoundly knowledgeable historian, and writes inch perfect obituaries. But Herb could have probably got more out of the parody, to be honest. Little Davy should have cut a 10 minute promo comprised <laughs> only of the words like, you know, so here's the thing. Number one, <laughs> like, you know, uh, here's the thing, <laughs> giving out five star ratings. <laughs> I believe there's a, a stat that he's never given Kurt Angle a five star match. Kurt Angle. I don't think he's ever given him a five-star match. Once again, ratings are subjective. It's really up to you. <laughs> you know, it depends on your personal taste. But I, I correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think Dave Meltzer has ever given Kurt Angle a five-star match. That in itself, that's his opinion. But wow. The Memphis Territory has an uneven history and reception. Jerry Jarrett was a pioneer of excellent pro wrestling television. His influence is felt all over the very best show-long storylines in WWE Raw's history. He was the first to open the Forbidden Door, and the first, or at least most famous, table wreckage happened in that territory as part of that fantastic angle involving Randy Savage. It was also considered a joke territory. Bret Hart famously thought it was a phony disgrace as a result of its wacky brawls and lamentable gimmicks. There was Dirty Rhodes, a portly fellow with bleach blonde hair who's first <laughs> Dirty Not Dusty Rhodes Dirty Rhodes Dirty Rhodes This is great this is fucking fantastic. First name was a synonym and last name was the same as Dusty's. There was incredibly Macho Warrior Rick Hogan. And the <laughs> Macho Warrior Rick Hogan. <laughs> this, is, this is fantastic, bro. All these wrestlers sound like they're products of something from Wish. <laughs> you get Macho Man, you get... Uh, Ultimate Warrior, you get Hulk Hogan from Amazon. You go to Wish, you get Macho Warrior Rick Hogan all together for one price. I'm done, man. Incredibly, Macho Warrior Rick Hogan. <laughs> and it was also the Hornet, an insect with the ability to sting. Who was Sting's <laughs> doppelganger brought into the Hornet? 
He can steal the brand to the USWA to take on Brian Christopher by Jerry Lawler. They were upfront about it at least. Lawler outright told the emerging Ron Oaks that Sting painted his face to build his confidence. So he should just be Sting. The name was terrible. Hornets can Sting, yes, but they're still just crap wasps. And that's our list. No many other iconic wrestling gimmicks. This was fantastic, bro. I gotta like this video. <laughs> Wait, what was that name, bro? I got... <laughs> Dirty Rhodes. <laughs> oh, Macho Warrior Rick Hogan. That's that's fantastic. Nah, that's fantastic. I had to like that video, bro. <laughs> Macho Warrior Rick Hogan. That's that's great. That's fantastic. <laughs> Macho Warrior Rick Hogan. I'm done. I'm done. Comment down below. Let me know what's the the funniest <laughs> stolen gimmick you've seen. If it was in this video, if it wasn't in this video, if you've just seen it before, comment down below. Let me know that wrestler's name, pre, uh, please. Or if you can come up with a funny stolen wrestler's name, put it down below in the comments. But I appreciate all the love and support. Round 50k. I appreciate y'all kicking with me. See y'all next one.